Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I am Charlie Sykes. Marjorie Taylor Greene woke up literally laughing this morning. Tim, did you wake up laughing this morning? Did you? Ha! 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 Those morons, yeah. She I learned had her lesson. committee assignment stripped. Ha! Yeah, no, this this is her. I woke up this morning literally laughing, <laughs> thinking about what a bunch of morons the Democrats plus 11, referring to the 11 Republicans, um, what morons the Democrats plus 11 are for giving someone like me free time in this Democrat tyrannical government, all caps now, uh, conservative Republicans have no sand committees anyway. Oh, this is going to be fun, exclamation point. So what I would put this down as remorse, nada, forget the condition, learned lessons, nothing. Marjorie Taylor Greene. So what do we do? Hey, um, by the way, Tim, before we really get uh, going, I want to, uh, I just want to pitch uh, the, we have a free offer for listeners to this podcast. If you go to thebulwark.com slash Charlie, you can get a free 30 day trial membership in Bulwark Plus. Sign up for it. And you have 30 days. And if you don't like what you hear, you can, you know, I don't know, go back to what else would, I don't know, spend your time doing. Um, but if you do, if you uh, if you listen to the Next Level podcast, if you listen to the Secret podcast, if you read my newsletters, uh, The Morning Shots uh, or The Triad by JVL, and you think that it is something you want to be part of, considering the fact that we are still in this long-term fight against the crazy uh, you can stick with us. But again, uh, this is something that uh, we're only promoting on this podcast, thebulwark.com slash Charlie, uh, free 30-day trial membership in Bulwark Plus. And in fact, if you uh, if you remember Bulwark Plus, uh, you could have also uh, watched our live stream last night. We do this once a week now, or at least we're planning on doing it once a week, where uh, the crew gets together and talks about uh, what is happening. We had a preview of uh, of uh, impeachment last night with our good friend Adam White. Uh, so again, to, just to con consider consider doing that because there's all kinds of cool stuff, isn't there, Tim? Can I just I yeah? Can just, I just throw out there? Also, you would have please. missed if you don't have the board plus on this week's Next Level podcast. I I gave my RuPaul's Drag Race season thirteen power rankings. Uh, you know, if you're in a RuPaul's Drag Race uh, pool with you and your friends, I let okay. you know who I think the strong strong queens are this year. Uh, I know that's what a lot of folks are looking for. We also talked about politics, but, you know, just in case. So the guys from the New York Post are going to hear about all of this. <laughs> you, 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 you saw my, my tweet, which was really, really good, and I had a typo in it. Um, was looking at you on uh, looking at you on the Nicole Wallace show yesterday, and, you know, you had the hair down and everything. And I, I, I thought you had kind of a pretty strong Shroud of Turin vibe going there, Tim. Well, I've got some news. I don't know how you're going to take it, Charlie, but you were mind-melding with somebody, our friend from the commentary podcast, John Pethoritz, who I thought was off Twitter, but he DM'd me. He must lurk, saying that he thought I looked like a Jesus Christ superstar. Uh <laughs> So, kind of in the same, you guys are in the same vein. I don't know, I am a Christmas baby, and you know, I, we'll see, I don't, the problem is that my hair's grown so long now during the lockdown here in California that we, we're on lockdown, I could get a haircut if I wanted to, by law, uh, Gavin Newsom does allow that now, but I don't, I don't know what to do now, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm lost, it's, you know, too big to fail kind of well, situation. There, so, there are, there are we'll scissors out there. I'll, but I'll in, take any, any thoughts and email if any, any hair experts out there. You know, I was actually into the Shroud of Turn for a while. I was actually really, really interested in that whole thing. And I read like a lot of history of it. it. Well, and, and, and the science behind it. And, and now, of course, I'm thinking, ah, oh, there was any of that true. I mean, I really don't know anymore. You know, I mean, one of the things we've learned is that there are so many rabbit holes out there. And, you know, maybe this is. No, maybe I've just become too cynical. By the How way, deep did of, you get in the Shroud of Turn history? This was not I something know. I ever, I never did that rabbit hole. No, I, I read about it a lot. I was, I was, mm -hmm. I was, I was interested in it. And, mm -hmm. you know, I actually like looked up things about, you know, photography, you know, how it could have been faked if it was a fake and everything. Mm -hmm. You know, look, I'm 99%, no, not 90. What, what percent of our audience even knows what I'm talking about here? This is the... A decent amount. There's God-fearing so. people in the Bulwark podcast. I don't know. Okay. So speaking of, of rabbit holes, before we get into your great piece this morning yeah. um, about the, you know, trying to explain the, 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 the weirdness of this vote to where we have... On one night, we have uh, overwhelmingly in, in a secret ballot uh, Republicans in the House of Representatives voting to keep Liz Cheney 
in her position. And then last night, overwhelmingly, like 90 plus percent, 199 Republicans vote to keep Marjorie Taylor Greene on her committees. I mean, obviously, there's a little difference between the public ballot and the and the secret ballot. But the weirdness before we get into all of that, though, is the, the mind of Marjorie Taylor Greene is is a, is, a, is a scary thing. But let me just play a little bit of her explanation when she was trying to pretend that she had kind of sort of learned her lesson and just, you know, the, the, the sorry story of, of, of how a good woman from Georgia just falls down into this dark place. Here's Marjorie Taylor Greene. These things bothered me deeply, and I realized just watching CNN or Fox News, I may not find the truth. And so what I did is I started looking up things on the Internet, asking questions like most people do every day. Use Google. And I stumbled across something, and this was at the end of 2017, called QAnon. Well, these posts were mainly about this Russian collusion information. A lot of it was some of what I would see on the news at night. And I got very interested in it. So I posted about it on Facebook. I read about it. I talked about it. I asked questions about it. And then more information came from it. But you see, here's the problem. Throughout 2018, because I was upset about things and didn't trust the government, really, because the people here weren't doing the things that I thought they should be doing for us, the things that I just told you I cared about. And I want you to know, a lot of Americans don't trust our government, and that's sad. The problem with that is, though, is I was allowed to believe things that weren't true, and I would ask questions, questions about them and talk about them. And that is absolutely what I regret, because if it weren't for the Facebook post and, and comments that I liked in 2018, I wouldn't be standing here today, and you couldn't point a finger and accuse me of anything wrong. Yeah. Wrong. Because I've lived a very good life that I'm proud of, my family's proud of, mm. my husband's proud of, my children are proud of, and my, that's what my district elected me for. Yeah, no. No, um, I, I, I love the, the personal responsibility. I was allowed to believe things. Skilled so practitioner I, I, of, the pra of the passive voice, if nothing else, Marjorie Taylor yeah. Greene. Well, yes, and if I just hadn't liked some of these things, you know, like like everybody else does, you know, I mean, like everybody does stuff like, you know, writes posts about the Jewish space lasers and, and you know, goes to the Capitol and says that Muslims shouldn't be able to serve and uh, harasses teenage boys who would survive school. I mean, everybody does that, right? Everybody posts a picture of themselves with an you know, AR-15 saying, you know, I am the worst nightmare of these minority members of, of, of Congress posing her own freaking poster uh, of her holding the gun next to the face of, of these Democratic representatives. I mean, like, who hasn't talked about putting a bullet in the head of somebody you disagree with? You know, it's like, Oh, this woman's just so I was just liking, full of shit. you know, I was just liking it. Like other people were talking about skinning faces and executing Nancy Pelosi and how Barack Obama was a Muslim. And all, all I was doing was just, you know, clicking that like button over and over again, just yeah. like every, everybody does. Okay, uh, so uh, in, there was in, one, there was one thing yeah. just there in her little t sure. talk I wanted to point out. Uh, I, I like how she lumped in Fox with CNN. Oh, yeah. oh, as as, I as like I just can't trust the information I'm getting from Fox anymore. I do. It does kind of, you know, uh, raise the question: um, Where is she going to be getting her info from now? You know, I mean, she can't get it from QAnon anymore. I guess apparently, uh, but she, I don't. I still can't. Don't think she trusts the main trusts the mainstream media. Uh, it didn't seem like there was a, a commitment to to fact huh? finding there. Hey, uh -oh. we have we have breaking news though. Okay, um, you know since we're on the religious shroud of turn vibe yep. stuff, information. You, you you heard that Mike Lindell, um, the My Pillow guy, is releasing mm. this three hour movie today, two or three hour movie today, which will expose all of the voter fraud. And if it doesn't, <laughs> this is the part I like the best that uh, that if it doesn't catch on, that basically that's going to be the that will you know, usher in the uh, the the end times. Um, we pray and we go to heaven. It's over. So um, I, this, I the, the Kraken, just... the Kraken movie is going to be released today, and it's going to change everything. Other, and if it doesn't, it's apocalypse now. Yeah, I want to say this in a way that is not at all. You know, I, I understand that people have substance abuse issues that they're dealing with, and I have nothing but respect for that. But I like in this situation, I do, I do think that that Mike Lindell might be back on the crack pipe. <laughs> 
I, I just don't I just don't understand what else is happening with him yeah. right now. Cr- I mean, crack don't smoke itself, does yeah. it? <laughs> I mean, he has lost it. I mean, I guess maybe he never had it. I don't know. But um but you know, I, I just stepping Wait, back and we know he's a crazy pillow guy, but just stepping back, like to to have your whole identity and, and, and your faith and the world wrapped up in Donald Trump's like really bad ham handed lies is is i mean yeah, uh, you really yeah. think that the end times are coming over donald trump's lies like the end, i mean the, I, the end times I you, mean, look, I, you know other you, people you have look, end you, time you, fantasies that are at least tied to things that have i don't know some you, weight to them or serious you you mock but when he's the governor of minnesota <laughs> i'm just i'm telling you the guy's gonna be the governor of minnesota okay so in my in my newsletter i just before we, we, we get into yeah. your analysis of the caucus I did a little bit of a flashback, you know, ancient history from the before time, actually just two years ago. It's kind of amazing. Just two years ago, January 2019, uh, the House Republicans stripped Steve King from Iowa of all of his committee assignments. I mean, they threw him off Judiciary and the Agriculture Committee because he said something stupid about white nationalism and white supremacy. Now, it's interesting because, you know, I mean, they were pretty far gone by 2019. I mean, they'd they'd gone along with everything with Donald Trump that allowed him to marinate and all of his his conspiracy theories and bigotry and everything. But they still had this residual instinct for political hygiene. And so they didn't wait for the Democrats to vote. They, the Republicans kicked him off the committees and that ended his political career. And the reason I'm bringing that up is like, you know, there was an alternative here to what happened last night. I mean, the contrast is pretty, is pretty great. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, Steve King was a really bad guy, but he's really almost not even in her league. I mean, you don't have the, the denial of the school shootings and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, it was an easy one. I mean, she because and she has a much longer history and everything, but it's a less than a month since the the insurrection. The Republicans had a precedent for getting rid of toxic members. They could have cleaned this mess up themselves. They could have taken it off the front page. They could have they could have done this instead, as you point out so eloquently this morning. Instead, what do they do? They give her a standing ovation. They do absolutely nothing. And they allow a floor vote in which Republicans, and this is from your piece, voted 199 to 11 in a public ballot to keep the assassination supporting, school shooting denying, coup backing, anti-Semitic and anti-Muslim bigot in her position on the House Committees for Education, Labor and Budget. I mean, really. You want to talk about political malpractice. You could have done the same thing that they did with Steve King. Instead, Kevin McCarthy has the caucus out there, walk the plank, and now there's 199 members whose opponents are going to be able to have these ads going, hey, when you know push came to shove less than a month after five people died at the Capitol, they voted to keep her on these committees. It's Yeah, and it, 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 King, you're right with King, and uh, uh, you're right with King, Charlie, and you're also right, uh, you know, this is not... This is something that Republicans have done before, right? And when I when I was at the RNC, uh, we did the same thing with Todd Akin. Remember, I was on MS with yeah. uh, with Senator McCaskill the other day, and she was running against Todd Akin. The, you know, RNC said this guy's comments about, you know, how like a abo- <laughs> what did he say? Legitimate rape. Yeah, you know, legitimate about how rape. Your rape, yeah. your body just aborts itself. It's just like no, this is too, this is too far gone. I mean, you know, just the new information from Marjorie Taylor Greene. I mean, just yesterday, another quote came up about how where she was repeating what trump said about how omar and talib should go back to the middle east and how mm-hmm. obama was a muslim and like osama bin laden and obviously the, we've we've been through the jewish space lasers i mean I, th- this is a cut and dry call and and republicans have done it in the past and by the way in the past i don't think it was always out of pure of heart you know it no, was it was about not. political survival instead they, un- they understood it to cover their asses yeah, exactly. And so, I mean, you know, look, even a CYA condemnation of Marjorie Taylor Greene would have been preferable um, because, you know, at least you're sending a, a signal. And this was about uh, an article I wrote uh, maybe about a year ago now for the bulwark about how like vir- virtue signaling has a purpose. You know, we might yes. not like some kind of virtue signalers, but but like, you know, virtue signaling is good in a lot of cases. Sometimes it's important, particularly for leaders and public officials to signal that they care about virtue to signal that they don't that they do not want to be associated with somebody that is racist against muslims that is racist that is you know anti-semitic uh that that wants to shout down 
high school kids on the street after uh, you know a few months after their classmates got got shot up. I mean, this is a sick person, and and so you know that half of them gave her a standing ovation, and we'll get into the house side of things, but only eleven condemned her is pretty shocking. And here's the thing: right before the vote, I just wanted to because this actually I feel like got a little lost. Here was a tweet that she sent uh, two days before the vote, uh, once the vote had been announced. She said that uh, Speaker Pelosi was trying to pull her off her committees because of identity politics. She wrote, here's my identity, white woman, wife, Christian, white. And it's just like, I mean, subtle, why, subtle. Yeah, really subtle. I, I mean, in the most literal sense, she tweets that she tweets that she wants to support white identity politics, right? That this is that, that she is, you know, wants to be treated differently in a positive way because of her whiteness. I mean, this is, uh, uh, this is really well, I, dangerous, dangerous stuff, and we haven't even got. And you mentioned it, but we really haven't even contextualized it in in how complicit well, she now. is in, I mean, in, the, in the insurrection. I mean, what I think is the, the what you saw yesterday over the last twenty four hours is that the 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 Republican immune system to crazy has been completely destroyed. I mean, they they yeah. just they can't they can't uh, clean up their own house. They can't even handle all of this. So Josh Jordan had a great tweet though in context. The fact that uh, that over five times as many Republicans voted to strip Liz Cheney of her committee roles than Marjorie Taylor Greene really is all you need to know about the GOP in uh, 2021. Uh, you had 61 who voted to uh, cancel Liz Cheney <laughs> yes, in their world. Uh, only 11 uh, were willing to take a stand against Marjorie Taylor Greene. And by the way, I'm, I'm thinking about some of the, the, the you know good guy Republicans, including you know some of the at least one guy in Wisconsin who voted in favor. And, and and my guess is that the conversation would go something like this, like, you know, really, you know, Mike Gallagher, what the fuck were you thinking? And he would go, well, you know, Charlie, we can't have the precedent of having, you know, the Democrats tell us who, you know, we can have on our committee, to which the obvious response is, then why didn't you deal with it yourself? Why do you Republicans right. not deal with it unless you decided that you as Republicans were OK with this? Why did you do absolutely nothing? OK, so I, I just make one exception to that, yep. because I actually okay. thought Peter mm -hmm. Meyer, who I've been impressed with, I'm sure he will let me down because politicians let you down. He replaced Justin Amash in Michigan, yeah. I think seven. He, he, he put out a lengthy statement that basically made that same argument as Gallagher. But here's the thing. That guy's earned. The credibility to do that because okay. he showed balls on the impeachment vote. It was like the first vote he did after he got after he got elected. He said, "I'm going to have to impeach the president of my own party because this is so cut and dry." And and he's given he's given answers explaining the context, right? I mean, uh, sometimes you know it is important to worry about precedent. I I think this is a clear cut and dry case. I don't I don't share his view on that, but 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 these guys like Gallagher. And this goes into to my article are just part are just so afraid of the voters, so afraid of their own shadow that like they they conjure these excuses for everything. And it's like, why should I believe you that you're concerned now about precedent when, like you said, Charlie, you didn't take care of it in your own house when you refused to stand up to Donald Trump for five years? You know, when you, uh, uh, um, you know, can't you know, signed on to one of these letters, you know, about how we should rip away the votes from the people of Pennsylvania, you know, I mean, you, you lose your credibility. So let's, let's, in my newsletter, I deferred to you but for your piece in the bulwark where you talked about all this, you think that the caucus can now be divided into three groups, the fear caucus, the Kraken caucus and the Millhouse caucus. Okay. So for people going, well, what's the Millhouse caucus? Let's, let's, let's do it in reverse order. The Millhouse caucus is what? Uh, we're not we're not talking about Richard Milhouse next. Uh, no, we're talking about Milhouse from The Simpsons. Uh, we're we're basically talking about people that are, that want to do the right thing, but you know they also want to be popular and hang out with Bart, and so uh, they're going to go along with they're going to go along with the MAGA nonsense unless things get really out of hand. And so, you know, they're the decently reasonable ones. It's the it's you know I defined it as either two ways. You know, if you're going to be a glass half empty person like me. Uh, you can say maybe there's really only 18 of these people. They're the 10 that voted for impeachment plus the additional eight that voted to um, uh, expel Marjorie Taylor Greene from her committees. Uh, another way to look at it might be that, you know, there's another category of people that are maybe gettable for Democrats on certain things who have described themselves on centrists who are in the past have voted for bipartisan stuff. And that gets you up to about 50 members of the House mm -hmm. caucus. And so somewhere between 18 and 50 are you know, I guess Republicans that are that you can deal with um, that that kind of let Trump 
Trump is Bart in this analogy, if we're not going to get strained too hard, uh, you know, let Trump run wild and, you know, pull down the, you know, give, uh, uh, you know, moon people and whatnot, um, you know, gave him a very long leash, but, but who at the end of the day might want to do the right thing. And if they really could just wave a magic wand, they would just put Mitt Romney back in charge and make things back mm-hmm. to normal. That's, that's about 15, 18 to, to 50 of these folks. Um, okay. All right. So then, then we have the Kraken Caucus, which is yeah. the the usual suspects. You know, the Madison Cawthorns, Lauren Bo- Boberts, uh, Matt Gates, right? Louis Gomer, Jim Jordan, Mo Brooks. Yeah, and I thought that it was really clear who how, how big that caucus is based on the Liz Cheney vote, because it was sixty one people who, even in private, <laughs> said, mm-hmm. "I want to guillotine Liz Cheney." You know, it's it, you it, you know those same sixty one people would vote for Jim Jordan to guillotine uh, Kevin McCarthy. You knew those sixty one people would have been just giddy if Donald Trump's coup had worked, right? I mean, they were serious and literal uh, when they were voting to overturn the Pennsylvania and Arizona elections. This is the scariest group. Um, most of them, most of them actually believe that Sidney Powell and Mike Flynn and all this stuff and my pillow guy. Most of them like actually believe it. Uh, a small percentage of them don't believe it, but are just that um craven uh and and so that's you know i think your core of the scary part of the republican base okay so and then we have the fear caucus which is would that Most be the big them. one yeah it's the, the majority one. you know and, yeah. and what, what what i was based this on was dave wasserman who's a really smart guy at cook political wrote that the republican caucus is divided in thirds um, you know, I think he called them the institutionalists, the floaters, and he was a little nicer about their names. But but when I when I went back and looked at all these votes, I wanted to look at, you know, basically the votes for certifying the election, the votes for Cheney, the votes on Marjorie Taylor Greene. If you look right. at all those, you see there's about 60 of them that voted on the crazy side on all of them. <laughs> you know, there's about 18 of them that voted, you know, mostly on the not crazy side. Maybe they had one moment of weakness. And then you have over 100 that are just scared of their own shadow, you know, that are trying to figure out and f- trying to figure out how to navigate this world where the party has changed underneath their feet. And and so when you look at those votes, a lot of these are people that I know and that, you know, mm-hmm. listeners who, who you know, have been paying attention to, to, to politics since BT before Trump would recognize as just being mainstream Republicans in the past. People like uh, Kathy McMorris Rogers. Uh, who gave the response to Obama speech one time, um, you know, uh, Gallagher, who you mentioned earlier, just so, so these normal, what, what once thought were normal Republicans. But then when you look at their votes, uh, you know, they some of them signed the Texas AG letter. Some of them wanted to overturn the Pennsylvania results. Uh, some of them, all of them uh, uh, wanted to keep Marjorie Taylor Greene on their committees. But these people all voted for Liz Cheney in the secret ballot, right? Because yeah. they're afraid of their voters. It was a secret ballot. They didn't have to worry about it. And they, they didn't want to be embarrassed. They're also afraid of their donors who are, who are getting, who are scared by the Kraken caucus. They want to keep them happy. So, so they're just trying to kind of navigate through the, uh, the shadows here. And Kevin McCarthy is one of them. He, he is from this Bush era where uh, all of a sudden Trump, he thought Trump was a Russian asset. Trump wins. Now he's got to get on board with MAGA. And he knows that his voters, when he goes back home and goes to county dinners, want him to be on board with MAGA, but his donors want him to, to be act more normal. And so they're just navigating through the wilderness. When you looked at these votes, you just see a lot of these incoherent people who are like i, I want to overturn pennsylvania's results but not arizona's and i'm for liz cheney but i'm also for marjorie taylor green it's because the 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 party has changed it's all performative. And they're trying to stay alive yeah it's just it's performative they don't want to actually do anything but they, they certainly don't want it they want to signal that we're okay um it, it is interesting there's kind of an interesting pattern that you see that uh, that somebody will sort of you know tiptoe into independence and then of course they get the backlash and then they will have to do various things to show that you know i'm okay with all you know throw out terms like cancel culture or this strange story this nancy mace where's she from in south carolina she she actually like seemed like she was a really reasonable open-minded independent republican who was willing to criticize the president and she's just been backpedaling like crazy i mean she's gone full internet troll gotten herself into this this uh, this fight with with AOC, but you, you can tell that it's all sort of a make good. Like, okay, I'm 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 sorry that I should actually showed some some intelligence and some open mindedness about uh, what's been going on here. I actually had some conscience, and now basically I'm going to go back to just you know um, you know performative magaism. 
Yeah, this is this is the most interesting little group because they're a subgroup of the fears. They're the people that wish they could be millhouses in their heart. You know, it's Dan Crenshaw, it's Gallagher, it's Nancy Mace. They want um, they, they 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 you know got into politics as John McCain style Republicans, right? And, and and but they have ambitions, you know, and so and they know that the voters are with the Kraken. At least not all of them, but a good percentage. You know, there was this Axios poll yesterday that you know even if the poll is off, you can see the gap. Marjorie Taylor Greene was, uh, you know, had a, about a twenty uh, or had about an eighteen percent favorable rating, like more more favorable than unfavorable. While uh, Liz Cheney was the inverse, more unfavorable than favorable. Uh, you know, so they're able to read those polls, right? And so if you're Nancy Mace and and you come to Congress and you say, "Oh man, I mean, the president just incited an insurrection over this fake voter fraud," I'm just going to say my piece, which is this is unacceptable. Uh, she said she was scared that day. Actually, this is an interesting sub yeah. thing of the AOC thing. She she said I was scared about you know my office people are running through. I didn't know what's going to happen, and then all of a sudden she starts getting blowback back in South Carolina, right? Just like Lynn, remember when Lindsey Graham got harangued at the yeah. airport when he said the one one mm-hmm. thing about how he was done with Trump. She started getting the same same treatment, and, and now. All of a sudden, she's like, uh, okay, well, you better believe in the secret ballot. She voted for Liz Cheney. But in her public persona now, she's trolling AOC and Elon Omar on Twitter. She's going on Fox saying, AOC was scared? How could she have been scared? And it's like, you said you were scared. Uh, you yeah, know, she's it's, voting it's, to protect Marjorie yeah. Taylor Green. Like, this is this is a prime avatar for the fear caucus. It and, is. It, 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 it's a perf- it is a perfect example. So let me tell you about a conversation, indirect conversation that I had here in uh, in Flyover Country in Wisconsin, uh, where Republicans in the legislature just, I don't know if you saw this, you know, chose that yesterday to um, repeal the mask mandate because the, was the Democratic governor imposed it. And I won't go into the whole story, but yes, a lot of people who are thinking this is pretty bad timing that of all your legislative priorities to repeal the mask mandate at a time when everything is peaking is bad politics. And so one of the I would say more reasonable Republicans is, you know, wrestling with this, what to do and, you know, knows that it's, you know, could actually cost lives and have, you know, tr- no negative consequences. But his, but, but his argument is that uh, 20% of his base, the, the base really wants the mask mandate out, the, you know, and, and it's 20%. It's 20% of his Republican primary voters who are just absolutely on fire, you know, Facebook posts, all of that stuff. And I thought about that and I thought, you know, okay, 20% is not that big a number. And at some point, shouldn't you have the guts on an issue of, say, public health, public safety, life and death, to be able to stand up against one out of five? Because if he's right, then 80% of his own base it would be okay with him. And you kind of wonder, I guess, you know, in, in the back of my mind, I keep thinking, if some of these guys had courage, had just the guts to stand up to some of these folks and say, okay, this is not right, this is wrong. You know, my experience is that, yeah, they, they'd face a lot of crap, no question about it. But some people would go, okay, we know you, we kind of trust you, yeah, maybe I shouldn't take those positions, and yet they won't do it. You know where I'm going with this now? Yeah, well, this goes back to that article that the mayor of Oklahoma City wrote in the Bulldog, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. and if folks haven't read that, they should go back and read it. It's interesting. When I when I was doing research for trying to understand the the folks that voted for impeachment, that Bulwark article had been passed around. Uh, all ten of the uh, Republicans in the House that voted for impeachment and and kind of buoyed them, right? Because they were like, "Yeah, that argument that you're making right there, Charlie, and it's one that David Holt made, is 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 right." You know, it's like sometimes you just have to say, "This has gone too far," you know, and 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 I have to risk. Um, going against what the base wants. And I always go back to, obviously, Reagan was, you know, bad on gay issues, um, particularly related to AIDS. But on this one issue, related to teachers and schools, you know, the, 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 you had the, far, the Christian right was, was saying that gay people shouldn't, um, you know, be able to teach in schools because they're all pedophiles or whatever. Um, and, and there was a ballot initiative the same year as one of Reagan's, I think, his reelect. Um, uh, and and in like the last month, when it looked like the ballot initiative was going to pass, he told his staff, he was like, I need to come out against this. Like, this is just wrong. Like, people need to be able to teach in schools. Like, like this is too far, right? And so, again, not this is not to say Reagan is a saint or heroism, because he obviously had some other major failings on this issue. But it's like, so, you know, 
when you're a rep, sometimes you got to say, this is, you know, 4,000 people are dying a day. This is too far, right? Yeah, like right. I can go along. Maybe I'm going to go, you know, maybe I'm not going to profile and courage and stand up to these guys every single time and do what Adam Kinzinger is doing and go on MSNBC and shout out. You know, mm-hmm. maybe you don't need to go that far, but sometimes you got to just say, this is too far. Well, and also it's, it's not like, I mean, pe- people don't want to be lectured by, you know, the New York times and NPR and everything, right. but, but if it's a trusted voice that says, look, um, we, we can't be in denial of what happened at Parkland. We cannot say that the, you know, the Sandy, Sandy Hook massacre did not take place. We, you know, um, it, it goes too far to be talking about, I mean, like, come on, you know, you're, you're not the kind of person that really wants to put a bullet in the head of, of Nancy Pelosi, even though you, you dislike her. And my experience is that most people go, okay, yeah, you know, maybe I, I won't, don't want to go along with that. Okay. Now where I'm going on this is Ben Sass, and let's let's put him in the context of of, of the Millhouses or, or whatever, because Ben, ben Sass broke our hearts a couple of years ago when, when he decided to go quiet and everything. Now he is safely reelected; he's got that six year term and everything, um, and he's been pretty outspoken. And I think I personally think he's going to vote to convict the president. I know I'm not; it's not a unanimous opinion among the bulwark uh, elite. Um, you managed but, to hold he, over JVL now. I know, yeah, I know, so because I'm always record. right on this sort of thing. No, I'm just kidding. But I, so, it, but, and he's been very, very forceful. The Nebraska, like this has been happening all over the country, where the local Republican parties have been incredibly um, Trumpified. And so anybody that shows any independence is going to get a resolution of censure. What's interesting is that there are people who are willing basically to stand up and say, I don't care. I'm all out of bleeps to give on this. You know, I, mean, I thought Cindy McCain's, uh, you know, reaction to being sens- uh, censured, so it was, was so good. What did she say? It was like, you know, it's a badge of honor, right? Yeah, yeah. And I don't, I don't care. So it, I mean, a lot of this is just they, their power comes from the belief that people can actually, be, if, you know, the, the belief that they are strong. Once they're exposed as not being strong, once people go, I don't care what you think, you know, it's, it, you know, it, it, it changes the dynamic. So here's the story in Nebraska. They're about to pass a resolution condemning him. And Ben Sass has issued a pre buttle And if people haven't seen it, go watch the whole five-minute video. It's just him looking into the camera and talking. And this is, this is how he begins. Guys, I want to talk to the State Central Committee. I've heard from many of you in the days since the attack on the Capitol, threatening another censure for what I said about the president's lies after the election. As a friend and fellow Republican, I want to shoot straight. I'm not going to spend any time trying to talk you out of another censure. I listen to Nebraskans every day, and very few of them are as angry about life as some of the people on this committee. Not all of you, but a lot. Political addicts don't represent most Nebraska conservatives. (laughs) Guys, I'm not even going to try to talk you out of it. You know, I just, it's, you know, I, I I don't care. And then he goes through and he says, look, you know, I'm not the problem here. Just folks that you know me. And he talks about, you know, how he's a conservative, has a strong record. And when he was first elected, he stood up there. You were the people that gave me the standing ovation. When he said, I will buck my party when I think they're wrong, you gave me a standing ovation. And then, of course, now it's like, no, no, you, you, you have to be you have to do whatever Mr. Trump tells you to do. And so. He, this is one of those moments where he's kind of speaking truth and he says, you know, I'm not the problem. It was the president. And his little riff where he's just kind of reminding them how we got to where we are was the president who lied to you. But what Americans saw three weeks ago was ugly, shameful mob violence to disrupt a constitutionally mandated meeting of the Congress to affirm that peaceful transfer of power. It happened because the president lied to you. He lied about the election results for 60 days despite losing 60 straight court challenges, many of them handed down by wonderful Trump-appointed judges. He lied by saying that the vice president could just violate his constitutional oath and declare a new winner. That wasn't true. He then riled a mob that attacked the Capitol, many chanting, hang Pence. If that president were a Democrat, we both know how you'd respond. But because he had Republican behind his name, you're defending him. Hmm. Okay. So here's Republican Senator talking to fellow Republicans. And here's my favorite part. Here's the kicker. You are welcome to censure me again, but let's be clear about why this is happening. It's because I still believe, as you used to, that politics isn't about the weird worship of one dude. 
The party <laughs> could purge Trump skeptics. But I'd like to convince you that not only is that civic cancer for the nation, it's just terrible for our party. Straight into my veins, Dan. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. He, yeah, okay. I have to say, I've been, you know, Ben has been so disappointing because he was with yeah. me. He was like my guy yeah. for a minute. Yeah. And, right. you know, and, uh, but even one of my friends who, who finds him really sanctimonious and grating, um, which, which I have, you know, uh, mm -hmm. you know, become sympathetic to that view, uh, texted the other day and was like, yeah, this is pretty good. <laughs> I mean, this is exactly right. And the point about the political obsessives, I think, is under understated too right i mean it is the you know kind of very onlineization of our politics right like this idea that all of the republican voters demand that republicans stand in lockstep behind whatever you know facebook meme is going around right now you know um i, I think that there is there is this like kind of warped sense like where it used to be that political obsessives were obsessed about policy that was kind of healthy. Like now political obsessives are obsessed with like, you know, the Nancy Mace versus AOC fight. And that's like, yeah. are, are most of Nebraska voters, do most of Nebraska voters really give a F about the Nancy Mace versus AOC fight? Like, no, I don't think so. So, I, I mean, hopefully he tests this idea, right? Because he really did it before his primary. And I wish yeah. he would test it because I, I've said back since 2016, it's like, Nobody has – I don't demand that everybody would be Tim Miller and, and troll Trump on everything, right? Like nobody really tried the method of criticizing the crazies, picking their spots, and winning re-election. You know, everybody either went underground mm -hmm. like Ben Sass or Jeff Flake where they, you know, did the right thing and then left, right? And I, I'd like to – I hope that this Ben Sass stays so that we can, you know, try out this – this hypothesis that this is workable. Exactly. No, this is this is really an important point. And again, you know, he we we were really mad about Ben. I mean, Ben was was almost dead to me um, when he, when he voted to uphold Trump's emergency order on building the wall. I thought that was kind of a bright line. Come on, you're a constitutional scholar. This was ridiculous. Um, and so I think I ranked, you know, who are the worst senators, you know, in America, you know, I mean, I mean, who are the worst senators on that issue? And, and he and Tom Tillis were at the top of the list, Tom Tillis, because he had completely flip flopped on the issue, Ben Sass, because come on, we expected more. And then of course he went silent for a long time, which was, eh. but you know, this is, you know, ha having said all of that, if the Republican party has any future whatsoever, if there's ever going to be any hope in this civil war, this is the kind of thing that has to happen. I'm basically a guy looking at other Republicans saying, hey, guys, you know me. OK, you know, you know who I am. Remember when you thought I was the best thing? I know I am still who I am. I still vote in a, in a, in a conservative way, but I'm not going along with the lies and with the crazy. You know, um, I actually kind of remember when we all thought that politics was about something other than, you know, kissing up to some weird dude. Um, and I'm going to still be that way. And also in this video, he reminds people that when he got reelected, he did way better than Donald Trump did in Nebraska and that he won in Omaha uh, where Donald Trump was defeated and actually lost some, uh, some, some electoral votes there. So this is the kind of thing, yeah. and your, your point is exactly right. Let, let's see how this actually works because the speech that he gave is the speech that the Mike Gallagher's of the world are afraid to give, which is like, guys, okay. I, you know who I am, you know what my priorities are, and I am just not going along with this, right? You, yeah, can, you, there... can, you can say that. And I think that there are going to be folks who agree with it, but also this calling out of the people, you know, this the, the hyper online people. I, I just remember a couple of instances when I used to be a talk show host where – you, like the NRA would sometimes appear to be just so incredibly powerful and, and the legislators were just being inundated with some crazy idea and, and and they were under the impression that this is what everybody thought. And yet if you push back on them at a certain point and go, hey, no, come on, this doesn't make any sense. It was kind of interesting that that, you know, how sometimes not always, obviously, when it came to Trump, but sometimes it would sort of like evaporate like mist in the morning. And so I, I do think that, especially when you get into the QAnon, the weird shit about the Jewish space lasers, mm -hmm. you know, push back, say, no, I'm sorry. Republicans don't put people like this on committees and it might not be so toxic as people think. Yeah, you know, your Republican women of Brown County are going to be all pissed off about it and they're going to have Facebook memes. But you know what they represent about what, you know, 17 percent of the base? Screw that. Right. 
I mean, I, I was, it was interesting, you know, you're, you're sounding a lot like uh, Jamie Herr Butler, who I talked to last mm-hmm. weekend uh, for an article and uh, who voted for impeachment. She's super interesting. She was, she's really conservative, much more conservative than me, you know, comes from this homeschool evangelical <laughs> background, um, but, you know, voted for impeachment. And, and I was pressing her on this, like, I, how do you navigate this world? You know, uh, how do you navigate Marjorie Taylor Greene? And and she was saying, and if you looked at her statement yesterday about Marjorie Taylor Greene, you know, her first paragraph was basically, this stuff is crazy. And then the second paragraph was, I'm concerned about the precedent. And so just like Meyer, I'm like, I, I want to, I'm going to give her a little leash on this one. Because it's mm-hmm. like, her point to me on the call was, I need, the, the people that bought into QAnon need to hear from me. You know, like like mm-hmm. they're not gonna they're not gonna be brought out of the crazy, uh, uh, you know, because they're not li- they're not re- listening to what's on Nicole exactly. Wall's show. You know, they're not watching it, right? So they need to hear from me. I'm of them. I'm one of them, and so uh, you know, I, I think that I'm I'm hopeful that that there will be at least some progress on that. And I think that because she's willing to do it, that shows. Sorry to pick on Mike Gallagher and Nancy Mace again, but like how cowardly that is because it's like they've accepted this conventional wisdom that you have to be lockstep to survive politically and nobody's really tested that it's like are you sure i did i mean mike gallagher's district is not complete it's not alabama you know like are we no. sure that he couldn't would survive politically um uh, uh, uh by you know just saying hey i'm against the anti-semitic anti-muslim bigots like it doesn't seem like that's that outrageous of a of a posture to hold. Um, no, so- it, it, it doesn't. And that's why we have to create that space. And can I just make a little note for there's, there's still a group of uh, progressives out there that have decided that, uh, that, you know, all, all conservatives need to be excommunicated. You built this, Tim Miller. You lady, we, you know, maybe you should just sit down or maybe you should spend your time somehow. I don't know, you know, as in, a shepherd. Ex- yeah. Do, doing, doing something else. Like, um, really, it is going to be these voices, many of whom you disagreed with in the past, maybe even people who really disappointed you, they're going to be crucial. You're going to need them. Um, so this 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 thing that you often get on the very online left, which is, you know, like, well, screw Mitt Romney or screw all of these people. Well, if in fact you create an incentive structure where if Republicans next week, for example, during the impeachment trial, a Republican stands up and says, you know what, I want to put country over party, I want to put principles over this kind of tribalism. And and if the very online left says, well, screw you, you know, you, you, you built this, you're part of this. Well, don't be surprised then when Republicans huddle in the tribe, right? I mean, it's like, at some point, you have to understand that this fever is going to be broken by people that might not have been regular guests on MSNBC or NPR. Or the four board. Years they ago. hate us. <laughs> Honestly. Oh, they definitely. Oh, yeah. they, of course they hate us. I understand. I understand that. Yeah. But and, that and, and, and I, I agree with that. I agree that. I no. want to. While we're talking the very online left, though, I, yeah. I want to make a tangential point, which is um, that I totally agree with what you're saying, and I totally agree. That there's a lot of irrational people on the left, and and by the way, even like it, where, where it's like Joe Biden isn't acceptable. Not even forget us. You know, like you see yeah, somebody right, right. like. David Serrata that are like, you know, Joe Biden's only, you know, doing 1.9 trillion. Why doesn't he do 11 gajillion, uh, you know, dollar stimulus? It's like, please, people. But but on the right, I, I do worry, I, I we're going to need people to step up. We're going to need the Jamie Herrera Butlers and the Ben Sasses to step up. But they need to be held accountable to, to when they try to create an equivalence, right? Like, we need to be clear-eyed about what's happening on the far right. And I saw this Mario diaz Bellart thing, which really bugged me yesterday. And he voted to rip Marjorie Taylor Greene from her committees, but then went on a long thread about how once they take back over, he's going to also strip Elon Omar of their committees. And I don't, Great. I don't like Elon Omar that much. Like, she's not particularly my cup of tea. Uh, I think it's cool that she is, you know, uh, I mean... You know, the fact that there is a like a devout Muslim woman, uh, you know, in Congress, immigrant. I mean, that story is is great. Uh, so, you know, some of her comments aren't, aren't comments that I'd, I would want to endorse, of course. But like Marjorie Taylor Greene, what what has happened in the, in the Trump party is so aberrant from what is acceptable within normal political discourse, and and, and we need to be clear about it. And so, just like. We, we need new recruits. We need those new recruits to be clear eyed about why, you know, what was happening with Marjorie Taylor Greene and what's happening with Donald Trump and what led to this violent 
coup attempt at the Capitol, deadly coup attempt, is so unacceptable. And and like that is then is where I get frustrated because it's like, okay, well, I want to give these people a little bit of rope who are late to the party, but I, I just I can't give them the rope if they're going to be late to the party and then also say, oh yeah, but also to Rashida to leave. I, I just I can't. That's too much for me. Is that, is that, am I being too harsh on Mario Diaz Bolart, Charlie? Uh, I, I didn't I didn't see his comments, but but again, that this, this is part of that uh, that you know signaling <clears throat> that you know I'm I'm still okay. I haven't actually gone over to the other side, which right. I don't know. I, I I go back and forth between you know the um, I, I I don't want to hear from you people versus you know what if we're going to survive this and go and get through this, we're going to have to make alliances that might be a little bit uncomfortable. Um, the Ben Sass thing, I'm, I find it very easy to go, okay, I'm, I'm willing to get over what happened. <laughs> yeah. if, if you're going to say these things, we're, we're, we're going we're going to be, we're going to be fine here. Um, so I, yeah, I, I think that's part of it, but it, it, it's interesting how I, I, I was, was thinking about the, the way that the term cancel culture has become this, this, uh, this, you know, the, 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 the cliche of the hour for the, the right, but how dam damaging it is when you think about it, you know, any criticism, any attempt to hold people accountable or to say that there are consequences for your words and actions now is rejected as part of the cancel culture. It's become, you know, on the on the right, how these cliches are have, have replaced ideas and actual coherent arguments. And what what the invocation of the cancel culture has done, that that phrase cancel culture is that's one of the things that has destroyed all of the antibodies against crazy. Because we used to understand as conservatives that, you know, things like personal responsibility were important, that, uh, yes, speech should be free, but that there were consequences for speech. Now you have somebody who goes out and behaves like Marjorie Taylor Greene or some of these other folks. And any attempt to say, you know what, that's wrong. Um, you've crossed the line. Oh, that's just cancel culture, cancel culture. So it is, it is it's become kind of a deadly thing. So, you know, people on the right, I think, have been trapped by their own cliches now. Uh, I mean, and if there's ever going to be a position that you can be canceled uh, uh, for your political views, I would think it would be a uh, House of Representatives member. I mean, <laughs> I mean, you know, it's just like this whole thing is so ridiculous. It's like, I, yeah, you know, I'm happy to have the, you know, in regular folks, you know, who did a tweet when they're in high school. Sure. Like I'm with you. But, but you know, now that we're adapting this. It's like, OK you know, people are elected to Congress and are, are asked to hold positions of responsibility on House committees based on their, you know, political views, right? So if their political views are so far outside the mainstream and so disgusting and so racist and so bigoted and so false that they need to be removed, like that's politics, not cancel culture. You know, it's not like if Marjorie Taylor Greene got canceled because she, you know, did a fr frazzle drip Facebook post and she was still a CrossFit instructor i might be like okay i you know I, I think if a crossfit instructor you know wants to post about frazzle drip on their facebook page that's not great and and but, but they probably shouldn't be fired for it but like member of congress on the house education and labor committee is a different animal yeah i mean wh whoever made the decision to let's let's look at marjorie taylor green and put her on the education committee and that, that's so i mean that was I don't know. Talk about a self, a self owned. So I'm, I'm, I'm seeing um, from uh, my local Wisconsin media here that, you know, things aren't going well for Marjorie Taylor green, but uh, she can absolutely count on the support of uh, former Milwaukee County Sheriff, David Clark. I thought is, you were going to uh, say Scott uh, Walker. I'm sure Scott. We, we, should, we, we, we should, we should devote another, an, another podcast to that, that question as well. What's happened here. Um, so anything else on your mind, what should we be watching over the weekend? Uh, one, one, one thing that I, I, I'm, I was thinking about this morning, um, not to interrupt you, but yeah, uh, and, and I see Amanda Carpenter, our colleague, is, is tweeting about this as well. And we started off with uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene tweeting out that she woke up this morning literally laughing. You know, that's what Donald Trump's going to do if Republicans cave in on, on the impeachment. You, you know that if, um, that, uh, that, that if they do what they're almost certain to, to do, Donald Trump is going to be spiking the football. And uh, any reckoning with what happened on January 6th will become almost impossible. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, I, I was happy to see the Democrats had called for him to testify, as, as I had written about in the Bulwark earlier this week. I, I, I mean, he said that he's not going to testify. And I was happy to see our friends at the Lincoln Projects, you know, calling him a chicken this morning for that. I, I, I think that... Um, 
you know, he the, this is incumbent upon the Democrats. Like this, this is a you know, the Democrats have a tough task next week with this impeachment trial because the Republicans are going to try to make it about these stupid constitutional arguments that you know Adam White so deftly um, rejected last night on the Bullock Plus live stream. We can still get if you remember, um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, and they're they're going to want to make it about oh, what aboutism and every other crazy thing under the sun. Uh, Hunter Biden. The Democrats need to be relentless about calling out Donald Trump, making him feel embarrassed and ashamed that he's not testifying, making him sit in his little room in Mar-a-Lago in the you know Hussein corner of Mar-a-Lago and get mad at how nobody's defending him well enough, and and, and they need to hold the mirror up to all those Republicans that allowed the insurrection to happen and that sat silently for three, two months while Donald Trump tried to steal the election. Uh, and, and while he pressured Georgia, uh, secretary of state, while he pressured DOJ and, and while he encouraged that, that riot that caused the death of officer Sicknick, uh, this is not easy. You know, um, it seems like it is easy because it's such an open and shut case, but, but there's a lot of procedural games that could happen. And so, I mean, I think that is the most important task for the Democrats and for everybody who's allied with them next week is to make this as painful as possible if they're going to acquit him. And play um, the videos, play the play videos, the video. play, the, play the hits. So uh, there's a Politico piece uh, with the headline, Trump's allies fear the impeachment trial could be a PR nightmare. And, um, you know. The, the, the boosters, oh, you know, fear reputational damage. Well, there ought to be reputational damage. That's the whole freaking point of this. But what's really interesting is this one tweet, which I'm, I'm not sure that I, I, I am. I'm, I'm not actually sure that I'd seen this before. Um, this is something that he tweeted at six o'clock the night of the of the insurrection. Have you seen this? I have, okay, so I have to be honest, this, I saw this when I, I'm in the same place you were. I saw it yesterday and I was like, yeah, yeah. man, I had lost that one in the shuffle. Right, right. Okay, I'm glad to hear you say that because I thought I, because I have followed this pretty closely. So this is six o'clock um, on the day of the insurrection after, after, you know, all the bloodshed and there was no question of what had happened and what was going on here. And he tweeted out, these are the things and events that happen when a sacred landslide election to victory is so unceremoniously and viciously stripped away from great patriots who have been badly and unfairly treated for so long. Go home with love and in peace. Remember this day forever! Exclamation point. Whoa. These are the things I mean, that happen. I just keep reading back and forth. These are the things that yeah. happen. Mm-hmm. Right, is so viciously stripped away from the great patriots. Yeah. And then he says, go home with love and in peace. Remember this day forever. If that is not celebrating and rationalizing the attack, I don't know what would be. I mean, this is this is the the the, the wonder of, of, of Twitter because we can speculate endlessly about what was actually going on inside his mind. Well, he told us. He told us then. Now he deleted that after an hour. He deleted that at 7 15 on um january 6th so there's a consciousness that maybe i shouldn't have celebrated all of this but um that that if if that's new to you and me then it's going to be new to a lot of people i i agree i couldn't agree more tim miller thank you so much for joining me on the podcast i appreciate it as always see you charlie And thank you for listening to this weekend's special bulwark podcast i'm charlie sykes we will be back on monday And we'll do this all over again.